According to the most recent assessment by the Parliamentary Budget Officer, this year's federal deficit, meaning the difference between what the government spends and takes in in taxes, is on track to be more than $250 billion. And to think just a few months back, a $25 billion deficit seemed like a lot. Where will the feds get all that money? Let's ask. In Ajax, Ontario, there's Janet Ecker, former Ontario Minister of Finance. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Jim Stanford, economist and director of the Centre for Future Work. And in Toronto, Craig Alexander, chief economist at Deloitte Canada. Good to see three familiar faces on our airwaves. And Janet, I'll put you to work right away because uh, when you were Minister of Finance, as much as you may not have wanted to, you probably had to run a deficit every now and then, and you had to go find that money. And this is what I want to get to now. In Canada, we've got the Canada Emergency Response Benefit. We've got a benefit for post-secondary students. We've got rent relief for small businesses. The list of programs is going on and on. And as, as I suggested in the intro, we are well north of $200 billion in new spending now. Where does a government go to get all that money? Well, there aren't a lot of sources, Steve, unfortunately. Uh, one columnist was saying how he wanted to curl up in a fetal position when he read the Parliamentary Budget Office report, and I can quite understand that. I mean, it's either more taxes, less spending, uh, or more borrowing. And, uh, you know, there's no easy way out of this. And unfortunately, there will be a price to pay whatever options the government federally and the provincial governments choose to try and get us back to some some semblance of, uh, of balance um, over the next years, generations maybe. Um, every one of them comes with a price. Uh, more taxes, uh, less spending, more borrowing, they all have a big price to pay. So there is no easy or short uh, path out of the current situation that we all find ourselves in. Craig, let me focus on one of those options with you, borrowing. If the government has to, let's say, borrow that $200 billion in order to fund those new programs, where do they borrow the money from? So they, they, they will borrow the money in, in global financial markets. You know, they'll issue uh, government debt. That debt will be bought in part by domestic investors. It could be things like Canadian pension funds, um, which are, you know, big, big capital vehicles in, in Canada. Uh, but it also could be borrowed by international investors that are looking to invest in safe government bonds in, in, in today's world. Um, the really important thing to highlight is while while there will be a fiscal cost, like, you know, I, I don't disagree. Ultimately, we could see higher taxes and governments needing to rebalance and reduce the deficit down the road. In the near term, they're not going to be doing that. We're still in the midst of a very deep recession, the early stages of the deep recession. In the near term, it, they're going to get the money by basically borrowing the funds. Hmm. Okay, uh, we've often heard, I'll do a quick follow up with you on this, Craig. We've often heard Doug Ford use the expression, you know, don't look to me for the big spending programs. I haven't got a printing press in the basement of Queen's Park. Now that's true. The question is, does Justin Trudeau have one? Is he helping to pay for these programs by simply printing more Canadian dollars? Well, I think there's there's two two important points here. The first one is, it's incredibly cheap to borrow right now. The The federal government can borrow um, by issuing a 30-year bond offering interest of 1.2%. And so it, the, the cost of, of borrowing right now is, is enormously cheap. And this is, this is actually critical for, for the federal government, for the, pro, for the provinces, uh, and for the global economy when we look at other governments. The second, the second point is that Canada actually was in a good fiscal position before this crisis hit. Like if we look at the share of debt compared to the size of the economy, the debt to GDP ratio was around 31%, which is actually quite low and very low relative to other countries. And so the Canadian government's debt to GDP ratio may jump, it, it'll surge in response to the economic contraction and all of the borrowing that's going to take place. But the ratio of debt to GDP is only going to go up on the basis of the programs announced so far to around 48%. And if we think back to, you know, where do countries get into trouble? When we, when we had a crisis in the mid 90s, the ratio was around 67%. And the rate of interest, and this is really important, the rate of interest was around 9%. So we, we, you know, the, the bottom line is I get asked by a lot of, a lot of businesses and, and Canadians, you know, can we afford these programs? And the answer is yes, we can. And 
although the parliamentary budget officer gave us the, the 252 billion estimated deficit, that's only on the programs announced so far. I think we're going to have a lot more programs being launched in terms of stimulating the economy and helping to drive economic growth. So we're, we're not, we, we haven't got the full price tag yet, but the good news is that Canada uh, had run very sound fiscal balances for many years, for the last couple of decades, and we're now living on that fiscal dividend. Yeah, so, Jim, Steve, an example, an, Steve, an example of the sort of rolling over debt that Greg's talking about is Britain was still paying off Napoleonic war debt from the 1700s in the 20th that. century. Yeah, so uh, which was an interesting statistic. So with interest rates low, and I certainly know uh, the Ontario Financing Authority here in Ontario was, has been busily rolling over long-term debt uh, for precisely that reason. Okay, Jim, let me get you into this conversation here. And I, pre I presume you are on side with what Craig just said in as much as uh, interest rates have never been so, almost never been so low, and therefore, if you got to borrow, now's a good time to do it. Do you get, do you get at all concerned about debt as a proportion of the size of the economy, given that it may actually double by the time we're done with all this? You know, Steve, there's a lot of things to worry about in today's world, and federal government debt is not one of them. Okay, so if you're going to lose sleep tonight. Lose it about your relatives, your loved ones, uh, flattening the curve, uh, you know, even your job and how you're going to get back to work. Don't worry about the debt. It's more than what Craig said. It's not just that it's cheap to borrow, it's free to borrow. So the 30 year bond at 1.2% and some of the yields on other long run bonds are even lower. That's below the rate of inflation. That means we're paying back less real value than we're actually borrowing. And that's not an accident. It's uh, deliberate. It was deliberate policy to drive the interest rate down and keep it close to zero. And the thing that Janet and Craig haven't mentioned yet, most of that federal debt that is going to be issued this year is going to be purchased by our own bank, by the Bank of Canada. They have finally gotten on board with the quantitative easing strategy. They were slow to that party, if you like. Uh, other central banks have been doing it for a long time. Now Canada is doing it. The Bank of Canada is buying $5 billion of government debt a week. Well, do the math. That's 250 billion a year. There's your federal deficit uh, right there. The Bank of Canada is also going to be buying provincial government bonds because provincial governments, uh, as you mentioned, do not have their own central bank. It's not a printing press, but it's, it's a central bank. So they're going to be dependent on the use of these federal powers to keep interest rates close to zero and to facilitate the borrowing. I don't think we'll ever pay, pay back that debt. I think it will, we'll just uh, keep it and roll it over forever, but we'll put the economy back to work and will grow the economy so that the debt doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when the interest rate is zero anyway. And it's got nothing, uh, frankly, to do with what our, our, our so-called fiscal management was before. Uh, the federal government has no limit on its ability to do this. And to see that, just look at Japan. Japan today has a debt to GDP ratio of 250%. So according to Craig's uh, argument, Japan should be in chaos, but they aren't. And they're doing exactly what we're doing in Canada, which is financing essential new savings, and, or sorry, spending, uh, by using the central bank to finance this government debt. So it's not, it is not a problem. It's only a problem for those who still follow a kind of old kitchen table economics, we must balance the budget motto. And most people around the world have abandoned that idea, and rightly so. Well, let me follow up with Janet Ecker on that, because, I mean, as you point out, it took 200 years for Britain to pay off the Napoleonic debts that were incurred uh, way back when. But that does fly in the face of everything we were sort of taught as kids, which is if you're going to borrow money, you better pay it back, and you really should pay it back as soon as you're able to pay it back. If you're sitting in those cabinet tables, at those cabinet tables, do you really not concern yourself with ever paying this money back? We just borrow and to hell with it? Well, that's how we got into the mess in the, the mid-90s in Canada when Greg mentioned 66%. We were in serious trouble as a country. They were, you know, we were the Argentine of the North at the time. Um, you know, we were in trouble. I mean, there are limits in, around what a government can do. And listen, running debts when you're in circumstances like this, I mean, that's why you want financial flexibility. I mean, that's why balanced budgets do matter. So you've got the room to move in to help save whatever you know, like in the current crisis uh, to help mediate that from uh, those circumstances. But the challenge we have and will have when this is over is less flexibility to manage. I mean, this isn't going to be the only black swan event that we get hit with. Uh, something else is going to happen. 
Um, the other uh, problem when people say, oh, well, we'll grow our way out of it. Well, take a look at the potential growth for the economy right now in Canada. We've got uh, whole portions of our, our uh, economy out there, small business, medium businesses in different sectors that are literally devastated. We've got an energy sector that has also been significantly, serious, seriously damaged. We've got an aging population. We've got trade protectionism uh, starting to move in around the world. And of course, for Canada, for Ontario, trade is one of our, is bread and butter. We've got a rather cranky, unpredictable uh, neighbor to the south. So the prospects for you know rapid growth or even substantial growth to help us get out of this, that's pretty high risk too right now. Well, Craig, having said that, let me put this to you. You know, I've spoken to lots of young people in their 20s and 30s during the course of this pandemic who wonder whether or not all of the debt that we're incurring right now to protect, let's face it, mostly older people right now uh, from the jobs that they have lost or the rent that they can't pay or whatever. And they are wondering whether or not all of this debt is going to equal massive tax increases for them if and when this economy gets back going and they get jobs and they start paying taxes. What can you tell them? them not to worry. I, I think that the, the government of Canada um, can afford uh, to do this stimulus. And, and we are in the worst recession since the, the Great Depression. Uh, this is going to be uh, two to three times worse than what we had in 2008, 2009 that we referred to as the Great Recession. Um, the governments deployed enormous stimulus during that period and it helped to stabilize the economy and help to drive an economic recovery. So this is actually the recipe for how you create jobs down the road that young people will benefit from. Now, I, I, don't, I don't agree with, with Jim that we should just consider that, that all the government finance, financing and borrowing doesn't matter. Uh, I don't think that it's a good environment when the Bank of Canada is buying up large portions of government debt and Canada does have to borrow internationally. And one of the things we saw in 2010 to 2013 in Europe was a fiscal crisis as, 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 as investors worried that governments couldn't pay their, pay what was due. So I do think that governments, when we get to the other side of the crisis, now we're not talking in in 20, 2020 or 2021. But when we get to the stage where the economy has recovered and growth is proceeding, at that point, the government is going to want to look at how to rebalance its finances like every government in the past has. And what they're likely to do is look at some mix of between uh, al you know, allowing the, the, the growth of the economy to and that will lead to, to improving fiscal balances. Um, surprised if down the road we do see higher uh, I suspect will 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 need to create some additional revenues to help pay the bills but I don't think young people should worry worry greatly about that at the moment in point of fact what the governments are doing is exactly what's needed to create jobs in the future which they will benefit from Jim I should get you uh, give you a chance rather to respond to that if you want to Sure. I mean, I'm not blaming young people for worrying about this. You know, they've kind of got the short end of the stick a, a number of ways uh, in recent years. So they're the ones who face a precarious job market. They're the ones who face global warming. Uh, they've seen, you know, cutbacks in different programs. But they, there's no automatic reason they should expect that austerity to hit them in the future. What they should worry about is a bunch of old farts running the country saying, now's the time for tough medicine. Uh, and that would cause problems for, for young people, but it's not an automatic economic mechanism. That would be all about politics. Uh, yes, uh, European countries did have debt crises uh, after the GFC. They were countries that don't, didn't have their own currency and their own central bank. Other countries like Britain, Japan and America, which had as big or bigger debt loads, did not suffer a, a crisis. And it, uh, again, even those problems were self-inflicted because of the European Union's kind of outdated uh, balanced budget uh, mantra uh, that they were following. So they... They, the worst thing we could do is respond to this downturn and the resulted government debts by cutting spending. The second worst thing we could do is respond to it by increasing taxes. The absolute focus should be on putting Canadians back to work, getting the economy going again when it's safe to do so. 
Um, much of the government spending that has been ramped up this year is automatically going to disappear. Things like the wage subsidy, of course, which were extraordinary, extremely expensive, but inherently temporary measures. So much of that spending is going to come off. We're not going to be running $250 billion deficits uh, regularly. Uh, and then uh, the crucial thing is uh, uh, putting people back to work, generating income, paying taxes. Uh, and that's what the focus of our, our government response should be. And I take it uh, old fart is a technical term from the study of it's demographics, a, is that right? It's a technical no, term, and, and I'm, I'm not, I wasn't referring to, to Janet and her former <laughs> colleagues in the Ontario cabinet. There you go. Ah, that's a, it's a relief, relief to know that. Okay. Let me read something here that the Globe and Mail editorialized about, uh, about a week or so ago. And it goes like this. You say, you may be asking, how will we ever pay off all of that debt? The answer, we won't. If all goes according to plan, Ottawa will not pay down the national debt, not by a cent, ever. Instead, the country's long-term fiscal game plan is likely to look like the one that financed the Second World War. In the 30 years after the war, Canada did not pay off the national debt. It even added to it. Yet the weight of that debt steadily fell. By 1976, the net debt-to-GDP ratio had dropped from more than 100% of GDP to a fifth of that. The debt went from being bigger than the economy to the economy being five times its size. So Janet, is this to say that uh, apropos of your Napoleonic example of earlier, we can grow our way out of this debt? Is that right? Well, the challenge is, is how much and how fast will growth uh, you know, be there? Uh, we're looking at, and, and that same column, if I'm re uh, recalling it correctly, also talked about the reason we were able to get out of some of this debt way back when was because we had good, strong growth, you know, 5 cent a year and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think we'd all think we died and gone to heaven if we had over 5% growth now. And as I said, the challenges the economy is facing, um, you know, with the, the trade, potential trade restrictions, with the, you know, the U.S. economy maybe going to be struggling, um, devastated industries, um, just you list all of the things that we're facing. Um, I think saying, oh, well, we'll just grow our way out of it. Um, that's a very risky strategy. So uh, there are no easy answers here. The, the other issue on the taxation side is that, frankly, I think uh, uh, tax rates, personal tax rates in Canada right now are, are pretty high now. And what you start to see when you keep raising them as has happened in many countries over many years, you start to get you know sort of diminishing returns. Um, you know, there just there just isn't as much money as you think you're going to get when you get over that 50% level. So there's not a lot of room on that personal debt side. Um, some say, well, raise the GST, but there's an economic price to that as well. So it's going to be a real challenge. I think it's going to take uh, a balance of uh, of strategies from governments. It's going to take a you know, all of the businesses out there that we're working so hard to try and save, uh, Canadian businesses are going to have to be looking at how can they be as efficient and, and productive, uh, you know, as they can be. It's going to be an all-hands-on-deck exercise, I think. Steve, mm -hmm. uh, if I could jump in on that, that World Please. War II analogy, which I think is very, very fitting. There's another uh, lesson to be learned from that experience as well. When we came back from the war, and, and in a way we're fighting a war now, aren't we? A war against a terrible disease. When we came back from that war, we didn't start tightening the belts and cutting back. We actually aggressively tried to put people back to work, including the returning soldiers. Um, and that involved a multiple decades long program of macroeconomic expansion, job creation, building new industries in Canada uh, and growing the economy. So that growth wasn't natural and it wasn't an accident. It was a deliberate strategy. And yes, Janet's right, there are some barriers to growth now, but there's lots of things that we could do about it. And I think we need to view the period after the pandemic, much like a, a post-war rebuilding exercise. We need something like a Marshall Plan, uh, where the government mobilizes huge resources in infrastructure and in public services and expanding public works, in putting people directly on the government payroll, as well as stimulating private recovery. And uh, if we make it happen, we can absolutely get back to a situation where we're close to full employment in Canada, and that would be the crucial engine for managing the debt, among all the other problems that we're going to face. Craig, let me do a quick follow-up with you on the issue of taxation. You heard Janet Ecker say, once you get over 50% for personal income taxes, it does become a, a bit of a law of diminishing returns there. I even remember NDP leader, former NDP leader, Thomas Mulcair saying, once you get over 50% personal income tax rates, it, it sounds a bit confiscatory. 
and that's a new Democrat. That's a you know social Democrat talking that way. Uh, do you think uh, whatever tax measures come forward, uh, that governments have to be super careful about raising them too high, lest people stop paying them, and it does become a law of diminishing returns. I, 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 as tax rates rise, you, 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 they, there starts to be diminishing returns, and it can actually a behavior. So, you know, when somebody's getting er, earning uh, less than fifty cents on the dollar um, because of because of their tax rates. It can lead them to change uh, their their decisions. So, for example, they could decide to work less because they're they're not being they're not benefiting as much. But I also think that when we think about the environment we're going to have coming out of the 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 post post COVID environment, I think one of the key things here is we're going to have more indebted households, more indebted businesses, and dramatically more indebted governments. And so the issue around debt and leverage is going to be a huge issue. Like before, before, before the pandemic, in the economy was the amount of personal debt. Um, during the, the pandemic, one of the key recommendations to keep businesses afloat is for businesses to borrow at low, if not zero interest rates. So when we get to the other side, they're, they're going to be carrying more debt. And, we, and, and in this call, we're, we're talking about the issue of how you know how are governments going to deal with their debt? So this is going to be a very profound issue, and I think that when governments are thinking about how they set their taxes, they're also going to have to think about issues related to you know how indebted households are and how indebted businesses are. I I, I agree with Jim that that one of the key elements of the future is how do we drive stronger economic growth. The reality is in the 1950s, 1960s, you know the trend rate of growth in the Canadian economy was around five percent. And in in at the moment, you know, before the pandemic, we actually thought the sustainable long term rate of a, in the Canadian economy was only 1.7 percent. Mm -hmm. And so, so the question is, you know, how, you know, in, if we want if we want to reduce the debt burden, right, without raising taxes or aggressively cutting expenditure, we have to figure out how to drive stronger economic growth. And this is something that we've had many agenda shows on you know how do we how how do we improve productivity how do we improve competitiveness how do we remove barriers facing individuals how do we remove barriers facing governments how do we how do we unlock the potential of our people and our in our businesses and i think that that narrative becomes paramount as we get to the 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 post lockdown environment we're going to lose a lot of small businesses here and we're going to need policies aimed at 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 accelerating the number of startups Right, we're going to need we're going to need policies that are really focused on driving economic growth, and they they really are going to need to to be the core priority if 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 we want to alleviate the the impact of the on the labor market from higher unemployment, and we also want to address the issue of the leverage that's been accumulated. Let me take that answer you just gave, and let me take an answer that I got to a different question on a different program a few days ago, namely that. Going forward, it may very well be the case that whatever government is in power is going to have to purchase personal protective equipment for every business in the country that deals with people, uh, particularly retailers, for example, and put this question to a former progressive conservative cabinet minister in Janet Ecker. Is this a tough time to be a conservative? It sounds like whatever path we take going forward is going to require the kinds of government intervention that that maybe even social democrats didn't count on in canada because every scenario i'm hearing involves a great deal more government intervention across the board in many areas that we hadn't anticipated what do you think well this is a tough time to be a politician of whatever political stripe uh, uh because I, again uh we're in unprecedented times and it's going to take a range of strategies i think to uh uh, to get us back into some level of, of economic growth, uh, stable society, prosperity, whatever we want to call it. Um, there's no question that government has a role, Steve. Uh, and listen, the conservatives I know are never, uh, you know, never say, oh, well, government doesn't. Of course, government has a role. The important point is what is it? How do you do it? What's the outcome? Are you going to be at, you know, efficient uh, at doing whatever the strategy is that you're, you're trying to do? This argument that somehow or other it's all you know up to government. Well, I got to tell you, there's a federal and provincial governments across this country 
we're going to be standing in front of uh, inquiries of some kind at some point answering about how well did we do. And while there's been a lot of great work by a lot of people, you can also point a lot of blame at a lot of people where government missed the boat. And so that is one of the challenges. Government is not uh, a painless option. It's a blunt instrument. There are always unintended consequences when a government tries to solve a problem. So it's not either or, it's a blended approach of how do we, because government can't make the economy grow without businesses being able to succeed. And so to, and so I think Craig mentioned that, um, you know, let's get rid of interprovincial trade barriers. My God, how many years have we been talking about doing that? Um, Only about 40. So, <laughs> and, as people, and as people like to joke, never let a crisis go to waste. I mean, there are incredible things happening out there in the economy. People are turning on a dime. Even governments on some issues are turning on a dime. Uh, for example, in healthcare, we are actually getting virtual care uh, starting to be established across the country in a way that, you know, again, could have been done years, maybe years ago. Um, so let's take a blended approach. Let's side any. Let's set aside anybody's ideology. It's common sense. Um, it's what's going to work. Uh, listening to the people out there on the ground in those businesses, um, you know, about how we can help them continue to grow. In our remaining moments here, I want to just start with our last area of exploration by playing a clip from Armin Yalnesian, whom you all know, the economist, um, who, um, an Atkinson fellow, who had this to say about the level of indebtedness we're all experiencing right now, both as governments, as countries, personally, and an option for how we might handle all that debt. We have a biblical lesson there from Deut Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, which is that once every long while, you have to wipe the slate clean when it comes to what we owe one another and press restart. And I think we are going to have such a mountain of debt, we're not going to know what to do with it. And just as COVID has caused us to wipe lots of things clean to be able to survive, we may have to take a very different approach to debt on the other side. Jim, what do you think? Everybody just cancels all the debt they're holding right now. We start fresh. <laughs> well, that, that would be one way to do it, for sure. Um, I think there is a, some role for a so-called debt jubilee, if you like, or for uh, basically restructuring. That's what happens when a company goes bankrupt, after all. You know, they go into protection. Uh, they, they put it through the, the washing machine, as they say. Some of the bondholders and others, uh, equity holders, take a haircut. And then the company comes out able to operate again. And I think uh, that will be particularly required. I don't think that's necessary, certainly not for the federal government. And if we do it right, it shouldn't be necessary for lower levels of government as well, as long as we're using some of those powers that we talked about, the Bank of Canada and so on, to support provinces and cities uh, in managing their own deficits. Cities are the ones actually who probably face the most painful fiscal crisis of any uh, level of government, and they're going to need help. Uh, in the private sector, I think uh, something like debt jubilee or washing, uh, washing machines or restructuring or haircuts uh, is ultimately going to be part of the thing. Um, I don't think we have to worry about that now. And I think the government, uh, uh, by trying to support uh, households, uh, biz businesses, renters, uh, students and others to get to the other side of this immediate emergency, um, uh, I think is, uh, is going to help us a lot. Uh, once we get to the other side and we start putting the economy back to work, uh, I think a, a lot of those uh, debts can and, and must be written off uh, one way or another. So I think there's a grain of truth to that. Let me leave the private sector out of this, Craig, for a moment and just talk about governments. Can you imagine a coming together, let's say at the United Nations, where all governments agree, you know what, we're starting from scratch when it comes to debt? I, no, I don't see a world like that happening. Um, and I think that ultimately, if you if you start to to raise the possibility that the that the the borrowers are not going to get paid, we're going to end up with a glo another. We'll end up with a global financial catastrophe on our hands. So I, I don't think that's and that's not the approach governments are looking at dealing with this issue, right? So mm -hmm. governments have governments are taking on a lot a lot of debt. Central banks are making sure that they can afford it by keeping interest rates incredibly low. And at the same time, they are, they are pursuing bond buying programs, at least temporarily, to, to contribute to lower uh, bond yields for governments. So monetary policy is working in coordination with fiscal policy to ensure that, that, that the interest rate environment is such that the rates are below the rate of inflation and that governments are going to be able to pay their bills. 
Uh, I, I, I do worry, I don't worry about Canada. Uh, I, I think that, you know, the federal government can afford the debts that it's going to be running. Uh, I worry a little bit more about some of the provinces, but not acutely. I don't lose any sleep over it. Uh, I think that you're probably going to have provincial governments that get credit rating downgrades, but I think I think governments around the world are all going to get credit rating downgrades. And so, in a sense, if everybody goes down a notch or two, uh, it becomes the new normal. And so, wh whereas before the the pandemic, w people were worried about you know Ontario, uh, the Ontario government getting a a credit rating downgrade. I, I think the reality is in the post-COVID world, governments are all going to be getting downgrades. And so it, it, in a sense, you, you change the benchmark and it, it doesn't matter so much. Hmm. Um, but I, I don't see governments just simply writing off, writing off the debt. Um, I think the solution to it is what we've already alluded to, which is growing our way out of the debt. And, and I think that you know, when we think about where governments you know, put their money, I think that's, that's where it has to be focused. Janet Ecker, last word to you, last minute to you. You know, a populist, a fiery populist politician could could really have a field day with the notion of a debt jubilee. Do you see it? Well, I think we're going to be at risk of populist solutions from both the left and the right. Uh, you know, as, as people come out of this, uh, we're certainly seeing some of that disruption down in the United States. Um, yeah, so I think I think certainly that's that's a risk, but hopefully, what we're going to have uh, from our governments federally and provincially is, as I said, a balanced approach uh, to sit down with the different sectors and say, what can we do sort of sector by sector, um, region by region, what can we do to push economic growth, support economic growth um, in, in that industry, in that company, in that region. They're not going to be able to save everybody. Uh, that's one of the real tragedies about this. Uh, but I think when you're seeing them sort of putting together their recovery plans, starting to think about what that longer term as we come out of this, assuming we do at some point, because of course we don't know um, if we have immunity after we've had it, we don't have a vaccine yet, et cetera. So coming out of this is a kind of vague term right now. But I think a balanced approach is what we need that focuses very much evidence-based on what's going to generate jobs out there. Janet Ecker, Craig Alexander, Jim Stanford, it's good of all three of you to join us on TVO tonight. Be safe out there, everybody, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Steve. Thank Thanks you, Steve. Much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you.